I was about to list in the Navy, but then my brother went in, my father died, and I had to hang around, and then they filled up the Navy. So I ended up in the Army, which was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, I could take care of myself in combat, but when you're on a ship and it goes down, <laughs> everybody goes with it. <laughs> we got involved so quickly, you know, they took me from Fort Dix, New Jersey, to Fort McClellan, Alabama, for basic. We had 16-week basic. The first, we, we were the first one to ride, run live ammunition. And we were trained as infantry. And that was, that was, a, that was a beautiful camp, you know, real nice. They had makeup, mock-up, I guess the word is, like building, wooden buildings. <clears throat> and the 30 caliber rifles from an M1 was going through them. <clears throat> and the guys on the other side of them got a little upset about that. We had the best sergeant. He was Sergeant Rhodes. He was tough and mean up until dismissal. When he, if you did something wrong, you got to run around the whole blacktop with what they call a bolo rifle, a red wooden rifle. You held it over your head. But when he dismissed you at, and he after all the training was over, kind of a guy he was. <clears throat> One day he said, "Kenny, come here. Did you break your crystal today?" I said, "Yes, I did." And he said, well, "Let me have it. I'm going to town. I'll get you a new crystal." So he was military till here, and after that he was a bird drinking buddy. We we started out with 22 rifles, and then we went to uh, M1 rifles, and I didn't know what muddy mountains were until I got to Alabama, and we took 20 and 25 mile forced marches with everything on our back, and boy, I'll tell you, I'd have sold my soul to get off of that mountain. That was bad, and we, we did... Um, I had BAR training, of course, hand grenades or pineapples, and we had uh, bazookas, and that wasn't the best weapon at that time. It came in two pieces, and where you put it together was right up out here. And when you shot it, you got all black, the powder on one of you there, and Thompson submachine guns, and handguns. 45, <laughs> I couldn't hit. A barn if I was inside of it with the 45. That was one of the worst ones. But I did real good with the rest of them. Real good. And explosives a little. We didn't do much explosives. The, the other guys did that. Now that I'm reading things that happened back in 38, 39, and 40, especially in Pacific, uh, I'm amazed now how we didn't know about it. I'm also amazed of how much we getting told about it, you know. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm an American. I'm proud of it. And I knew the guys were starting to go because I was. I had to wait till I was 18. I came 18 in December, and I went in in February as soon as I could. So I was one of the youngest guys in the outfit. Yeah, I guess that's why most of the fellows that I knew are, are going now, Kennedy and all, you know, just most of them are gone because they, I was so surprised. Kennedy was 89. I knew I was younger, but I didn't know I was that young. I was in the Lincoln Theater in Trenton, New Jersey, watching the movie, and my father was here, and my mother was here, and I had been wanting to get into service. And they turned the lights up, and they turned the movie down, and the manager came out, and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to announce that we have been attacked at Pearl Harbor, and it looks like we're at war. And I said, oh boy, and my father liked to knock me out of my seat, because I thought, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get in now, you know. But that's, that's where I were. Once you finished boot training, where were you sent? Oh boy, they sent us from there to uh, Fort Shenango, Pennsylvania, and we had a terrible long train ride, two or three days all around. And we ended up back in New York, helping sort some mail that was coming in. And it was so strange because we were there sorting letters. And you'd get a letter back, uh, killed in action of a fellow you trained with. You know, and we weren't even out of the States yet. And we hung around New York for a while. And then they put us on the, the, uh, the Ile de France, which was the fourth largest ship at that time, the fastest ship at that time. So they let us go over unescorted because they figured they, the uh, Germans couldn't get a line up on us with the subs, and we put they put us on life preservers in what they called e-hole, and we said to the one of the fellas, 
what happens if we happen to get hit? He said, don't worry about it. He said, we close everything above you. <laughs> so that was, that was comforting. I'd say that was a good trip, but we ended in the 4th of Clyde, Scotland. Came down through England, and we we camped there for quite a bit, down to Southampton, and then went to, to France. I was with a uh, service organization then, and we came from Normandy. We went through um, we went through Saint Lo, that area. And it was in Le Mans, France, that I, I was I was help servicing a field kitchen, and the uh, gasoline exploded, and I was quite badly burnt on the, the face and my hands and my arms, and I they took me to the hospital. They were great people. Here they like mashing it, you know. God, I'll tell you, I'd have married my nurse, but she was a lieutenant, and I wasn't allowed to date her. But uh, it, there was a a good bunch of people and that was what like I said three sixty three years ago and I just got a letter from the VA that they're they might consider compensating me if they can prove that I was in the hospital and all that stuff except I got pictures that I sent them taken alongside of my nurse mm -hmm. in my robe I got letters I sent my mother dear mom I'm still in the hospital one from my nurse that wrote one for me because I couldn't write so I don't know what they need for proof but uh, that's where we are today. I'm waiting for me to send me a million dollars. <laughs> they just came out with, in 1940, end of 42, with uh, penicillin, and it was real thick at that time. And I got four, sh I got a shot every four hours around the clock. This shoulder, that shoulder, this hip, that hip. And at night, when we would sleep, and Peggy Campbell would come in, my nurse, and she'd lift up the covers. And she'd take her hand and she slapped my rear end. And by the time I got over the shock of the slap, she had that needle in and out. And they assigned me to the 65th Infantry Division, which the best thing that ever happened to me. We went 800 and some miles in a little over 60 days. Of course, we were, we were in the 3rd Army under General Patton. We liberated the first death camp in order of Germany. Almost by mistake, we just happened to come across it. And we crossed three rivers, rip bridges, in four nights, four days. We were further than anybody else into the West Austria when the war ended. <laughs> mm. And they, when we got to Ordruf, the death camp, it got so overloaded that they started to annihilate them pretty bad, pretty, pretty quick. And when we got there, Eisenhower and Bradley and Patton showed up. Eisenhower was so angry he couldn't speak. <clears throat> Patton went around behind a building and threw up. He was sick. He called two fellows over. He says, go in town and get the Burgermeister and uh, at the mayor of the town. So they went and brought him out with his Hamburg and his big coat. And Patton says to him, when a kind of broken thing, are there any officers, Nazi, Nazi Ein, one, he took two more fellows. He said, go get them. So they went in and brought him out. Of course, he was very indignant. He had his great coat on and his cap and all his polished stuff. And so these are the officers who were indignant? The only one, yeah. Oh, he had a German, the German officer. And he was standing outside of Patton. And finally, Patton said to him, go, go. We're outside of the door of one of the, where all the bodies were and all. And he said, nine, nine. Patton says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He'd have shot him. So he did go in, and he came out with a handkerchief over his face. Then he sent in about three two and a half, that's two and a half ton trucks, mm -hmm. big ones, and brought out almost everybody, civilians from the town, and made them clean up and, and bury everything. Mm -hmm. They didn't enjoy that a bit, but that was kind. Of, and then you read these pieces about one out of five didn't believe that it happened. Wish I had them there. We weren't where you could get news except for the Yank magazine with the pinups in it and Stars and Stripes, you know, Betty Grable and all those girls. But we really didn't know. And what really disturbs me now, the older I get and the more I read, was how much they knew here. They had rallies in Madison Square Gardens against the, the Jews. 
father Coughlin was one of the worst. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to believe what went on here in that attitude. In the voyage of the dam, Hitler loaded 5,000 people on that boat and sailed all the way across. They were going to load them in Cuba. And he, uh, when they got there, they refused to take them. I thought that was pretty bad. So they could kill time. They, they took the ship up along the Atlantic coast and they could see Miami and Atlantic City. They turned around and brought it back. And they still wouldn't take them. We wouldn't take them. Nobody would take them. And that gave Hitler the chance to say, see, I tried to turn them loose. Nobody wants them. So they sent them back and most of them were, you know, killed in the camps. And the little kid like Anne Frank, the things that happened to these little kids, that's what breaks your heart. You know, I got thinking war, war is a funny thing. You have a conscience. But in, in that situation, your conscience becomes two separate pieces. You go with the attitude like Patton say, the lad a long time ago said war is hell. Well, Patton said war is for killing. You, you kill him or he's going to kill you. And you have to take that attitude because we, I, we figured, hey, I don't want to be here. I'm here because of what, you know, you caused it. We're over here because of you. And I, I want to go home too. So you do what you have to do. But then again, if you let the other side come over, you get thinking, well, some place there's a, like a mother and a, a wife and a, and a son that didn't get home, you know? And if you let that get to you, and that, 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 that kind of gives you problems later on. So you try to think about the crazy things that happened, the, the better things, the worst such a thing. And there were. There were some funny times, if you could say it that way. Like the, when one of my buddies put his helmet on a fence post and shot a bullet through it with his M1 rifle, and he wore it around going saying, I got the worst headache, I got the worst headache. <laughs> and it was things like that that, just, just crazy carrying on, you know. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, home. you'd be riding around and you'd see a German boot with half a leg in it, and that kind of changed the whole attitude right there. But we were, we were so blessed. We were so blessed with, the, with General Patton and the people getting all the supplies to us. They don't get enough credit. When we got up as far as the, the Danube River, and we were supposed to cross, and the poor lads, they tried to put out one unit, another unit, and the, the, and the mortars started getting, so they moved us about 1,500 yards down. And we went over in little boats. And then that got to be one of those scary times. Mickey Palermo and I were about, we got up to the bank. We were about 10 yards back of two lads in front of us, and they heard Germans talking up there in a little rut. So he thought, well, you know, what can they do? So he threw a hand grenade up, and they got real quiet. <laughs> and then we were told to, after we got up, to go around the back of Regensburg to take the city of Regensburg, which we did. That was a pretty good deal, taking that part. The Germans, the German people themselves, I, I had no nothing against, because they were just like us. They didn't want to fight that thing. But uh, some of them were, got pretty bad, especially the Nazis and the officers, throwing babies out of the windows of the, the hospitals and mm -hmm. catching them on bayonets and mm -hmm. the things they did to women can't compare it to what they did in Pacific. But it, it, was, uh, it was a sorry mess. One fellow one day, on a war we were on the road, come crawling out of a, one of those big pipes they put onto the road, and they come crawling through it. I guess somebody had grenaded on the other side, and half his head was hanging off it. He still crawled out, you know, for a second, and then he collapsed and died. And you wonder, you know, how many people around you are getting like that? When you see your buddy, you know, you give a fellow a cigarette in the morning and a couple hours later he's not there anymore. And Bob White. I think one of the worst things as far as I'm concerned are, is mortars. That, that's scary, mortars, because that just wiped him out. See, when you fire mortars like we did, you usually fire them in rounds of three. And they fire one and then they'll correct it, fire two. And they got you locked in. Well, you know where the next one's going to go. And if you're there, like when we got to the Saar River, we took we did a lot of action in Sruth. That was a great big battle. Regensburg, we did. 
when we got to Sarbrock and Sarlotten, we were crossing over a little stone bridge, and halfway across they started to put mortars on us. Of course, we hit hit the ground, and they tell you when when you're under a concussion like that to keep keep your butt, your stomach up off the ground because of concussion. And Canterbury dove before me to the curb, and I dove in back of him, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I had him by the rear end. And every time he pushed himself up, I pushed myself up and pushed him down. And later on, he said, Kenny, he says, I don't know about the, the bombs, he says, but I will never get your fingerprints out of my rear end. <laughs> I really had them, right? Because they dropped the shell here and then the shell there, and then you just prayed. But the other one went off the edge of the bridge on the other side of the brickwork. And the one that lads up front got his, his foot blowed off there. And it was not... We were kind of fortunate in those conditions right there, you know, but that was quite, there's some strange things, strange things happened. You know, one time, I can't remember where we were. We started to get some Arctic incoming stuff, and it was there were houses around, and I went around the house and I jumped in the bathtub. And as soon as I jumped in it, I got, I remembered, if you can fire a, a, a shell or a rifle, pull it into a tank and that's why it'll go round and round and round and make a hamburger. And all I could think about was here I am in this stupid tub and if something comes in here it's going to go round and round and round and round. So I jumped out pretty quick and I ran back out again. I thought it was safer out there. That was quite a day too. When we crossed the Saar, Saar lot and Saar Brocken, we went into Linz, Austria and into Enns. And in Linz is where we we met with the with the Russians. That was I was pretty much the final bet right there. The Russians had a blockade on that end of the bridge, and we had a blockade on this end of the bridge. And they had a two and a half ton truck that we gave them. And all of a sudden the um, barricade opened up and this truck come toward us. And we're sitting there with machine guns and all. We didn't know what to do. And they came to a stop on our end. And the uh, doors opened, and two Russian soldiers jumped out. And one came to me and slapped me on the black, like the back, like they broke my back, and handed me a flask. Yet then they took a drink, and I took a drink. I lost my breath. I couldn't even breathe. It turned out it was a female, a lady, a lady Russian officer. I didn't glad I didn't have to fight them. I'll tell you that that was that was an instance I'll never forget. But we met up with them there, and then we went a wee bit further. And we were in, my buddy and I were in a foxhole in Enns the morning of May the 8th that the, uh, the war ended. And they came around and said, about set dawn, I guess, that the war's over, the war's over, the war's over. And Canterbury over there had a couple of bottles of <laughs> lubrication, you know. And we got a hold of one. And boy, I'll tell you, they hadn't all the time getting <laughs> getting that bottle away from it. We had a good time. But then about that time is when I collapsed. I just went down into the bottom of the foxhole and the medics got me out. They finally got me out and took me back to uh, the vac station, I guess. And from there they took me, I think, to Reims. From Reims they, they, they didn't know if I had appendicitis or something broke or what happened. They, started treating me with all kind of needles and then they took me back to Paris, the hospital. Paris General Hospital was it? And they uh, decided that I uh, I couldn't didn't couldn't remember much after that. And the worst part about that is the sixty fifth infantry infantry division along with another one stayed over there as occupational troops. Well, from the time they took me out of the hole, I never got back. So I didn't get to take part of any of that. I never got to see any of the fellows again. And that's why today I don't, I don't really, after that morning, I don't really recall a lot of the fellows and places I went. Then they took me to Cherbourg to put me on a hospital ship called the Francis S. Langer. And I never gave thought to it. We got back home to Long Island. They treated me some more, and I got a medical discharge. And it wasn't for years later, in fact, only about five years ago, I was reading in a Reader's Digest about this nurse 
in one of these mayor's outfits that she and her, they had set up, and she and one of the officers stepped outside, and she was killed with an artillery shell, and her name was Frances S. Langer, and that was the name of the ship I came back on. And I got the strangest feeling over that, not knowing at that time, you know. But that, that, was, that was quite a thing. In fact, I got a piece out of the paper about her back then. They kept trying to decide what it was and what it was, and uh, I, I was in pretty bad shape, I guess. And after, after I going through quite a few doctors, one lad that really, really was good, he, he sat me down one day and explained to me that, is you have to realize, is you know, it's like you were leaning on the door with all your weight for quite a long time, and somebody just jerks the door open on the other side, and you can't do much more than just fall on your face. Seems like I've been trying to get up off my face ever since, you know. Mm -hmm. Except, so they gave me a little compensation for that. Since I got out, I, it was automatic. I never applied for that. And uh, if one day I can believe, if I, you know, I can convince them that uh, these are really scars, I did get burnt, maybe they'll see fit to give me some compensation for that. It's been a long time. VA. There were bad days. Especially when we hadn't any tanks around us, that got kind of hairy. They said we're getting tank, and we, we didn't want the tanks because they were bigger targets than we were. <laughs> Although Penton was a, a real tank man, and he really started to raise a lot of heck with the uh, quartermaster guys trying to get up. They couldn't get the gasoline up to us on the Red Ball Highway. We were on a convoy one day in there, and I was on in a jeep. Paul Giot was my platoon commander, lieutenant, and he was born December 7, 1924. Same day I was, so when he said something to me, he said, yeah, I said, hey, what do you want, Paul? And he used to give me the funny look, I said, well, send me home. <laughs> and I was riding on a spare tire on a 50 caliber machine gun, Lucky was driving. And we could see this, I think it was a P-47, wasn't a P-51, coming at us down at waving its wings, which was a good sign. And it went on past, and it wasn't, Maybe three, four, five minutes later, I had it coming back. We heard it starting to open up fire straight. It was a plane that had gone down, and the Germans was flying it. And they turned around and came back and started to strafe the column. Oh and you talk about walking on air. I'll tell you, we, we got out into the ditch so fast. One of the fellows had gotten a, an accordion someplace, and it got all shot up. And he was more mad about that accordion than anything else. I think he'd have felt better if they shot him, didn't, didn't get the accordion. I'd have been pretty upset about that. But there were some hairy moments. Yeah. But we got to a town someplace, I can't remember. I can't remember the name. Sar somewhere in the Sar Basin, I think. And we got to this old house, and Canterbury took the first floor, and I took the second floor. I had a BAR at that time. And when I got upstairs, there were two windows looking out to the fields and the table, so I pushed the table over, and I put the BAR on it, and I, I shot a, a clip, has a clip of 15, 30 calibers. I shot those out one window, and I thought, well, I got another clip, I put, and I moved it over the other one. Just as soon as I moved it over there, I could hear Sergeant Rhodes saying, don't ever fire an automatic weapon twice from the same spot. So I grabbed it, and I ran back downstairs again, and we weren't, 200 yards away from that house, and something hit the top of it. <laughs> the artillery coming in. Yeah, you, know, you were lucky. You had to be lucky. What I didn't care too much for was when we went out on patrol at night, three of us at a time. We'd tighten everything up, take our, our dog tags, and three of us would go out as far as we could go for observation. And getting out there, we, we would set up someplace, like in an old house on the street. And I was in the front door on one night out there, and my stomach started to roll and gurgle, and I thought it sounded like thunder. I thought every German within a mile could hear my stomach rolling. And then they started to, we thought it was troops coming at us. So we did what we're not supposed to really do, called for a flare for identification. And it turned out to be just a bunch of trees and stumps that had been shattered when the artillery and getting out of there and you worry about getting back because they had passwords. And, and if you ever got 
you know, messed up, and you, when you went out with, say, Chester, and you came back in with Chesterfield, and they changed it to Mickey Mouse or Lucky Strike, you were in trouble <laughs> because they didn't know who you were. And Art Lenz, the lad in that picture, on one of our patrols, he really lost it in the middle of a right in the middle of a field. He just threw the weapon down and threw his helmet off, and he wanted to, he was going home. Not to work, so we had to kind of get him tied up a little bit. Never did see him again. There were German patrols out there because we could hear them talking. We'd be going that way, and they'd be on another edge row someplace, and and they didn't want to bother us, and we didn't want to bother them. Like I say, you know, the average German. In fact, when we got to the Enns River and we were set up with the Russians, all the Germans at that time, after what they did to Russia, were really coming by the hundreds and coming around and jumping into the Saar River to get over to our, our side because they knew we'd take care of them. But a lot of them didn't make it because they, they machined them and the water killed them as fast as they could. They didn't want them to get away. Of course, the way the Russians felt at that time, you can understand how they felt. Can you tell me about General Patton? Oh, he was something else, I'll tell you. He, uh, when we were back in reserve one time, he came, you probably read about this, where he came across four fellows doing some mechanic work or maintenance work on the G, and he got on, he really got on to them bad because they were out of uniform. They didn't have their hats on their ties. <laughs> he was really gung-ho, that fella. But he gave us a talk one time when it was quite a few. There were engineers and infantry. And I, I can't remember who was up there with us. And he was up on a little platform, cool up on his Jeep with the two flags and all the stars. And he got up on this platform with his two pearl handles. And he gave us a talk about how good we were doing. And uh, he lectured this, that, and the other thing. And, and he was almost through. And he said, oh, he said, um, I got one more message for you fellas, and he pointed to the infantry, and he said, uh, you want to get your rear end shot off, and what, uh, what he said, you go ahead and get it shot off. He said, but you take care of those blank, blank rifles. I can get a lot of you, but I cannot get rifles. <laughs> he was quite a guy, quite Sounds a guy. Like <laughs> and then when we got to the Rhine, you know, Patton was in, Patton had the third, Montgomery had the first. They didn't like each other because Montgomery thought he should be the whole head of the whole thing, which luckily he wasn't. He didn't do very smart things. And finally he got to the Rhine and he, he wired back to to England and he said, I take pleasure in announcing, old Bean, that we have a, we have approached the Rhine. And about 30 miles down, Patton wired over and he said, congratulations, old boy. We're on the other side than we were the day before. <laughs> They were the good things, you know. Best thing you can get in the infantry. It's a, uh, it's a combat infantry badge. Any infantry, combat, any infantry soldier gets a bar, a blue bar with a rifle on it. And then if you're a combat infantry rifleman, you get one with the wreath around it, like on my, on my jacket. And that, that's about, I think that's about the best thing I've got. Best thing you can ask for, you know. This is a uh, original 1945 uh, Eisenhower jacket, and this is the CIB badge okay. right there. That's that's a good one, and this is a this is um, expert wreath of um, expert rifleman and TS Thompson machine gun, BAR, and grenade did that. And then we had, uh, this is a Europe ETO combat ribbon, and it has uh, three battle stars on it for three battles that we fought over mm -hmm. there. Of course, it got the good conduct ribbon in there, too. Got that when they weren't looking. Got the bronze ribbon on there. And this is a, that's a congressional, congressional uh, medal award. Is a congressional medal? And it's got an Oak Leaf cluster because we got it twice. That was a unit, whole, the whole unit got that for, we did something right, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, infantry guys are kind of funny back then. We, we, we looked different, we dressed different than they do today. We were sharp. And we took a lot of liberties like the paratroopers did. 
and we get away with it. We take a piece of uh, blue parachute silk and we make an S and we beat all sharped up. <laughs> Somebody say, you're out of uniform, soldier. I said, so send me home. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we would take our pants and turn them inside out and rub brown soap down the seam and then iron it. And when you put them on, boy, you had two knife blades seams sitting down there, just as nice as can be. Yeah, it was great. Blue. That's the reason why I went in the infantry, because I like blue. Okay. My blue eyes. <laughs> yeah. But that's an Eisenhower jacket. Ike didn't like the, the stuff he had. He didn't like the jacket he wore. So he told his tailor or somebody, he said, well, you make me something, you know, half decent looking, and they come up with that. I got out, and uh, they offered me my same job back at John A. Roebling's Sons Company, $7.40 a week. And I thought, gee, I don't know if I can handle all that money, you know. And I gave my mother five at that time before I went in service, and I had all the money I needed. But uh, like I say, I wasn't in, I wasn't in very good shape at that time, and I knew I wasn't. So I, I got with somebody and turned myself into the Veterans Hospital in Lyons, New Jersey. I was up there for quite a while, mm -hmm. and I got home on weekend passes. And then they would send me letters to report to this one and report to that one. When one of the hospitals in France sat behind his desk, and I couldn't take smoke. I just couldn't handle smoke at all. And he had a big glass ashtray on it, and he kept leaning back saying, well, you don't know how lucky you are, you don't know how lucky you are, you know, and kept blowing the smoke and blowing the smoke. And, and he said, this fellow's out here with, with lost limbs, you know, and he really, I feel like he's really putting me down, you know. And so I, I kind of got a little upset, and I went after him. And the war boys went after me. <laughs> had quite a party there for a while. But, but they tried, they tried. But like I say, I've, I've been lucky ever since. I get one of the finest doctors now for the last about 18 years. He's my best doctor and my doctor, my best friend. You know, he's he's, he's in uh, military, was military, he was with Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. And he came back here, Dr. Ferris Johnson, he just, they just don't come any better than him. So he's helped me through a lot. You know, sit down and talk, you know. And we landed in camp up in Long Island. And when we were in a little cafe, I guess you call it, in Cherbourg, we got out one night, four of us, and we're sitting around this little table having a little tonic. And this girl came out of the kitchen, a little French girl, and a little dog come running after her, a little black and white dog, cute as little thing. And I, I wanted that dog, and she said no. So we got together, and we each had, between the, all of us, we had two packs of cigarettes, car, packs. We offered the two packs of cigarettes. Well, that was all it took. So I got the dog. So we put my blouse, took it back to the hospital that night. Well, you're not supposed to do that. So we put him in the uh, in the, the bathroom. I get the head at the hospital. When the nurse came around, she gave us sleeping pills. Well, I broke one in half, and I gave one to me and one half to the dog. Over the nap right down there, and this slept well, real well. And next morning when we got, you know what a musette bag is? That's the one you used to, like, about the size of a gas mask bag, and you put all the stuff you had in there, important things like letters from home and your shaving gear and your, and, you know, your, your calvados, you know, stuff like that. And so in the next morning, they said we were going to go on, on, go on the boat on the Francis Langer. And we thought, oh boy. <laughs> hospital ship, so we got another pill, and we gave the dog half the pill. We got all dressed, and I put him in the musette bag, and I put my hand in with it so I could hold his little head up so it went smother. We went right on up the boat, and went down to wherever it was where they had the, the cots for us, and that's where we got in there. Somebody came up with a piece of cord or something, and we took the little dog, and we tied around one of the legs of the sink in the, in the head. And a couple hours after that, one of the flats came in, one of the, the, like, the medics, you know, and he said, who in the blank, blank, blank has got a dog in there? We said, don't know any idea about it. Now I suppose to have a dog on a house. I said, well, we throw it overboard. Well, we knew he couldn't throw it overboard. Well, he didn't. When we got home, we did the same thing. That poor dog, I bet he's, a, I bet he's a, a, an addict today. <laughs> so we gave him another little piece of sleeping pill. 
and got off the ship, off the hospital ship with him, went to a, a tent wherever they had us, and I went in to, to some place to find to call home. And when I called home, my mother answered the phone, and there was a lot of laughing and carrying on and on. I said, "What's?" She said, "Jim." I said, "Yeah, I'm on Long Island." What's going on there? She said, well, your sister just got married. So I went into the Red Cross room and I said, I'm going home. She said, you're quarantined. I said, I understand that, but I'm going home. There's two ways I can go. I can go, with you okay in it? Or I can go without you okay in it, one way or another. I went back and I got my A1 outfit, my class, A class one uniform, whatever it was. And a musette bag and, and psycho. I need the dog psycho. <laughs> I got pictures of him. It was a cute little thing. And I went back up. She said, well, we, we had somebody call home and verify the fact that your sister is in the process of unloading. And so she gave me a three-day pass. So I got home. And my sister, i never forget that. She said, here we will worry about how we're going to get away from the party. You know, can we sneak out the back door? So, you know, can we change clothes? But when I hit the front door, that was the end of her party. Everybody went crazy. We just, it, was, it came my party. And she never gave me for that. She mm -hmm. could have walked out with her, with her gown on with a band and nobody would have known she was gone. <laughs> so that was that was my homecoming. But my brother came down, my brother Joe, my younger brother. When I left he was about yay much smaller than me. And I got out of the cab with this little dog and somebody tapped me, so I'll get the I'll get the bill. And it was Joe. He was this big and I was this big. <laughs> so he paid for the taxi cab. But I built a dog house for Psycho, about the size of a uh, uh, Howard Johnson's and it was doing real good for about a week, and somebody stole them. Yeah, probably another addict. I'll never forget that old dog. Yeah, he was pretty neat. That, that was my coming home. When he dropped the atom bomb, we thought that was a... Truman made the greatest decision at all, because we probably saved a million men or more, because everybody was over there, even with bamboo sticks, they were going to fight to the last person. So they saved a lot. But there's so much of it that I wasn't aware of, that since I've been reading like I do, I'm becoming more aware of. And even in Europe, I begin to find out now where I was and what we did and the things that happened. And in, and, and, and in the Pacific, I take my hats off to those lads, the Marines and all down of the Bataan March. Yeah. There was a fellow right here in, in Winterville made our party last year for veterans. He was in a wheelchair with one of those little breathing tanks. He was on the Bataan March. He's died since then. But you just you don't forget it, you know. He, after my dad died, <laughs> my mother and father used to go to a little bar up in Trenton, New Jersey on Warren Street, owned by uh, Jerry Conti, one of the nicest fellows you'd ever want to meet. He was from Italy, naturally, and he had a little accent. And after Dad died, Jerry took so much, so good care of my mother that, uh, that he sent me packages during the war. And after I got burnt, they sent me gloves so I could cut this finger off so I could... And they would send me salami dipped in wax mm. so it would keep. And when you cut that open, boy, I mean, the, the other guys came from three miles around. Where, where's the where's the meat? Where's the meat? You know. So we had that with a little bit of uh, tonic. And when I got back, my uh, my mother married Jerry. And it was the best thing she ever did because he was just a first class guy, first class guy. For a long time, I know I wasn't easy to get along with. And I would uh, binge drink, I guess you would call it. Well, not really binge drink, like a 12-pack or something like that. But, and uh, I got pretty much out of hand for quite a while, because I, well, I, well I, I was, they told me if I drank any more whiskey, they put me back in Lyons Hospital, so I stopped that for two years and, and beer for a year, but I never really got back on it. So, of course, my little, my youngest Maureen, my little guardian angel, he calls me a binge drinker, so. I got to be careful because it kind of gets me down, you know. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, uh, it, I just never felt right about myself and things, and mm -hmm. especially not being able to remember that. That, that really, that really bothers me. Yeah. Liberty, I, I always thought was uh, having the right to live your own life 
and kind of within the law, do as you please. And this is probably corny, but you know, according to the Constitution, which we have. But recently, it's become to, uh, they're kind of rewriting some of that Constitution. And today, I always felt that your all your liberties, anything you think of do, ends at the beginning of my nose. You're okay from here on out. When you step inside of here, you're in Irish territory and you're in trouble. Uh, I just I just don't feel like it was the same. Like I said a while ago, I, if I thought all the lads, and somebody said to me one day when we had that party about, oh, you're a hero. I said, no, you got completely wrong. I'm a veteran. The heroes are still over there. And if the, all the heroes could get up today and come over here and look around, I think they'd go back and I'd go back with them if one for my family. Because this is not this is not the country we fought for. But the society and the kids today with their attitudes and the dope and the guns and the knives and and got the most hypocritical bunch of people and every day they pick up the paper they put this mayor in jail and this guy in jail and this chief police in jail and this you know, and it doesn't look it, it don't look right. I have disagreements with a lot of things that has happened and going on, especially. But, see, you're talking about something that happened in a given period, almost 60 years ago. And it's like coming out of a, a, a theater to see a war picture. It happens for a while, and then you come out, when you come out that door, it's behind you. And unless there's reason to have somebody, something remind you of it, you know, you don't daily live it or think about it. There are times when you do, but to me, liberty is the right to. If you, if you, it, it's pro. I think my attitude is, it's proper to tear something down if you're in a position to put something better in its place. Don't take advantage of it. You know, like I'll give you the shirt off my back, but I'll, I'll work you over if you take it from me. Liberty is having the right to go out there and make something of yourself. And boy, there's nothing you can't do if you really put your mind to it in this country. There's so much, so much attitudes. But today, I shouldn't, I don't want to get into that, but you know, all our people came from some other country back in the 1880s through the island. Each and every one of them, including my, my people, and all, I always brought up in our neighborhood, every nationality you could think of, and we ate in each other's house. The D'Amico's ate Italian, my food, and I ate Italian food. We all ate Jewish food. And when he got sick, Mrs. Render would bring you the chicken soup so it shouldn't be white. And everybody got along. Everything was great, you know? But everybody learned to talk English. I never remember seeing a sign on the corner that said in Italian or Russian or Polish or any other language. And we're paying for it today. Go to a school and it's at the drug-free area and, and a weapon-free area. When I was young, it was a, a chewing gum-free area. <laughs> and if you got caught with chewing gum, you got sent home. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty bad thing. And I wish we could go back to it. Because, you know, life's so short. And these kids are going to look around one day. And instead of riding, having a free ride, they're going to find themselves behind the steering wheel. And they're going to say, oh, my God. Now, what do I do? What do I do? It's, it's going to be a lost cause.